All right, so let's talk about carbohydrate catabolism. And this is going to be sort of generally true for probably most organisms, uh, at least most aerobic organisms, though there are some exceptions. Uh, something to keep in mind is that this happens after glycolysis. So you would have, uh, you'd start with glucose, or some other sugar. Have glycolysis. That occurs in the, uh, uh, usually in the cytoplasm. And you're going to end up with two pyruvates. And uh, as our earlier discussion in class showed, you've got two options at this point. If you have oxygen, you can continue on to respiration. If you do not have oxygen, you can continue on to fermentation. And in class, we talked about fermentation. And now I'm going to continue down the other path and talk about carbohydrate drate, catabolism and respiration. So we're going to follow one pyruvate at a time. Uh, and the next step after glycolysis is uh, what is called the transition step. Sometimes this is considered a part of the citric acid cycle, sometimes it's not. In eukaryotes, it's usually going to happen as the, uh, the pyruvate is being transferred into the mitochondria. In prokaryotes, it's going to happen in a variety of different places. But basically, during the transition step, you've got uh, three important components. You've got your pyruvate. You've got coenzyme A, which is a uh, basically a vitamin or, well, a coenzyme, uh, which is not going to be consumed, but which is going to be important throughout this procedure. And you have NAD plus because we're going to be breaking a bond and we're going to be capturing those electrons. So coenzyme A binds to pyruvate and that knocks a carbon off, which will leave as carbon dioxide. Pretty much every time we knock a carbon off and it leaves as carbon dioxide, there are some electrons that we can capture. And so NAD plus will capture those electrons and turn into NADH. The pyruvate, which was a three carbon compound, is now a two carbon compound bound to coenzyme A. And this is called acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA is the main entrance point to the citric acid cycle. Uh, by the way, the citric acid cycle is also sometimes called the Krebs cycle. Uh, and sometimes it's also called the uh, TCA cycle or tricarboxylic acid. Um, usually, like, Krebs cycle is considered to be kind of a more old-fashioned term for it. Uh, the tricarboxylic acid cycle is sort of the newer term for it. I tend to use citric acid cycle because, A, that's what I was taught, 
and B, it's sort of a happy medium that's going to be probably understood by both people who were trained earlier and people who are trained today. So I'm going to refer to it as the citric acid cycle, but they keep in mind that it does have these other names. So at the entrance to the citric acid cycle, we have acetyl-CoA, which is going to enter here. Now, there's a few important things to keep in mind about the citric acid cycle. Uh, first off, the reason we call it a cycle is it's going to be a set of reactions that go around in a circle. And they don't literally go around in a circle. But the important thing is that they regenerate their starting point. Uh, by the time we go around this entire circle, the entire acetyl-CoA will have been consumed. Uh, the, at the first step, um, acetyl-CoA comes in and joins with oxaloacetate to make citrate or citric acid. This is why it's called the citric acid cycle, because citric acid is the first thing that you make. You don't need to memorize all of these steps and all of these various different things uh, that are going around here, at least not for microbiology. Uh, if you go on to take a biochemistry course or a metabolism course, then you'll probably need to memorize all of those things eventually. But for right now, what I want you to pay attention to is what comes in and what goes out. All right? So acetyl-CoA... is important because it's what's coming in to the citric acid cycle. There are certain steps, which you can see here and here. During those steps, carbon dioxide leaves, which means that you are breaking a bond to a carbon atom, and that carbon atom is gonna leave as carbon dioxide. When you break that bond, there are electrons for you to capture in the form of NADH. So every time you break a carbon dioxide free, you get to make an NADH. All right, there's a couple of other important things here. One, right there, you make a GTP. Uh, GTP is guanosine triphosphate, and you're making a GTP, but it's going to be converted into an ATP in just a second, all right? So GTP, one GTP equals an ATP. Oops. So you're gonna make one ATP equivalent and right here, uh, we're not actually, um, here, we're not actually going to be releasing a carbon as carbon dioxide, but we're going to be converting this single bond here into a double bond right there. And when that happens, you can also capture some electrons. Um, the electrons that you capture don't have quite as much energy as ones for when you break a carbon bond. Um, so they actually don't have enough energy to be put onto NADH. Um, so we're going to capture them and put them on FADH2. FADH2 is basically, think of it as being NADH's younger brother, right? It does the same thing, 
except it doesn't quite carry as much electrical energy. So what we've made here, plus, because we've made them, are two CO2s, two carbon dioxides, two NADH, one ATP, and one F A D H two. Over here in the minus column, what we've consumed is one acetyl CoA, which remember is was made from one pyruvate. Also important to keep in mind is remember our first step, we took acetyl-CoA and combined it with oxaloacetate. As we go around in this circle, at the end of the circle, we have regenerated the oxaloacetate and it will then combine with the next acetyl-CoA and go around in the circle. Remembering you get two pyruvates from every glucose, so for every glucose, this cycle is going to turn around twice, once for each pyruvate. Some important things to keep in mind. At this point, your entire glucose, by the time you've gone around this thing twice, your entire glucose molecule has turned into CO2, right? For each pyruvate, pyruvate comes in with three carbons. You're releasing a CO2 in the transition step. And then you're releasing a CO2 here and a CO2 there. So you came in with three carbons. Three carbons have gone away as carbon dioxide. That means that by the time you get through the citric acid cycle, there's nothing left of your glucose, except the high energy electrons, which have all been stored on NADH and a little bit of FADH2. So let's talk about those electrons now, right? Because we've eaten up our organic molecule at this point, and what we have left is the electrons. So the NADHs and FADH2s are going to go to the electron transport chain. In eukaryotes, this is going to occur on the inner membrane of mitochondria. In prokaryotes, it's going to occur on various places, but uh, always on a membrane. The whole point of the electron transport chain is to create a proton gradient. What that means is we're going to be moving protons from one side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane. And for this reason, this is sometimes called the proton pump. We're going to be pumping protons, at least in net, from the bottom of this membrane to the top of this membrane. So let's follow the path of some of these electrons. We're going to come in with NADH, and NADH is going to dock at complex 1, the first important protein complex in this chain. And it will then release its electrons. When it does so, it goes back to being NAD+. Plus and H+, plus, and that's our first contribution to the proton gradient, is we just released an H up here in the top. 
These electrons go across the protein complex and end up on a, uh, a molecule called ubiquinone. So ubiquinone needs to be neutral to cross the membrane. So when it picks up the electrons, it's also going to pick up a proton from the bottom to balance out that charge. The ubiquinone is then released, travels across the membrane, and docks at complex three. Yes, I know there's no complex two. Complex two is used by FADH2, um, and it does the same thing pretty much as complex one, except it generates slightly less ATP. So here, our ubiquinone has moved across the membrane, docked at complex three, and remember it picked up an H plus at the bottom side of the membrane, and now it's at the top side. It's going to let those electrons zap across the complex. They actually end up being handed from one component to another, to another, to another, to another, ending up on a protein called cytochrome C. And now that ubiquinone no longer has those electrons on it, it doesn't need the hydrogen, so it releases it. But no, it picked it up on the bottom and it released it on the top. So it has pumped that proton. The electrons are going to move through cytochrome C to complex four, where they're going to go through complex four, back to the other side. And this is the, fi finally, we're gonna get oxygen involved. So here we have O2. O2 is gonna pick up those electrons. And we know that oxygen is an electron sponge. It's gonna carry those electrons away. When it does so, in order to become H2O, it's gonna need to pick up two protons. and become water. So what that means is how we've pumped protons. So we released a proton from NADH up here. We moved a proton from the bottom to the top. And then we consumed two protons in making H2O. So we've taken three protons away from the bottom and added two to the top. And for every pair of electrons that goes through this thing, that's what we're going to do. So what we've ended up doing is adding protons to the top of this membrane, taking them away from the bottom. That sets us up with a proton gradient where we have a lot more protons at the top of the membrane or on one side of the membrane than we do on the other. And diffusion tells us that these protons really want to go from high concentration to low concentration. There's what's called an electrochemical gradient. The, uh, the, the chemical part of it is that you've got all of these protons that actually want to diffuse to the bottom. The electro part is that all of these protons at the top have a positive charge, making this side of the membrane positive charged and this side negative charged. And all these positive charges want to get to the negative side. They can't go through the regular membrane and can't go through there. But there is a path that they can follow. There is a special enzyme complex called ATP synthase. As you might guess from the name, it makes ATP. ATP synthase is embedded in the membrane and it has a channel that protons can move down. 
ATP synthase also has this multi-headed top. And basically what happens is that as a proton goes down, the path is not straight. A proton has to move in, it has to go all the way around in a circle, and then it can come out. When it goes around in a circle, it's actually going to turn the proton, the protein, ATP synthase, um, the middle part of it, which is basically like a crankshaft. And as the uh, ATP synthase turns, it's going to change each of these head groups. And without getting into like the biochemical mechanics involved, as this thing turns around, it's changing the shape of these head groups so that ADP and phosphate are gonna get slammed together at exactly the right angle and they're going to become ATP. So let's watch this happen. Here we have, boom, our hydrogen goes through. You saw our ATP left and ADP docked on. Another one goes through. We turned our ADP into ATP and it leaves. And so that is how this proton gradient that we created with the electron transport chain is going to be used to run ATP synthase, which will create ATP. And this whole process is called oxidative phosphorylation. We're using the energy of electrons, which is oxidation, in order to drive the phosphorylation of ATP. And that's the way carbohydrate catabolism goes. Actually, this is pretty true, not just for carbohydrate catabolism, uh, but also for lipid and protein catabolism. Um, glycolysis is, is exclusive for carbohydrates. Uh, lipids and uh, amino acids have a different pathway that they follow at the beginning, but they all join in in the citric acid cycle. Um, they'll either come in as acetyl-CoA, uh, that's what lipids do, or they'll come in a little bit further down the cycle as various other intermediates. That's how amino acids get in there. Um, but how they generate ATP is, is basically going to be the same from the citric acid cycle on forwards.